Hello everyone. I am truly sorry that it has been so long since my last video. A lot of things have been changing pretty quickly for me. The last year was filled with some twists and turns as I'm sure many of you have also experienced. But I'm happy to bring another video to you guys and I hope you all enjoy it. This video is about the spacecraft that can be found in the Fallout series. A random encounter in the original Fallout reveals a crashed flying saucer. There are two alien bodies with enlarged heads which would seem to indicate that they were the pilots or passengers of the craft when it crashed. A weapon, the alien blaster, can be found there to be looted by the main character. That would be the end of it except for a note that states that the craft is property of Area 51 and should be returned if found. Although the whole thing seems like an easter egg, the Area 51 note seems to be a gag by the developers. The wiki uses the note to mean that the craft was indeed owned by Area 51 and crashed before the Great War, but why would you let two aliens fly in their craft all willy-nilly? The ship itself is a pretty standard disc-shaped UFO that was very popular in the 1950s and into the 1960s, and does not seem to bear overt resemblance to any one design. The flying saucer type of UFO was first recorded as being seen in 1930 in the Texas and Oklahoma area which is where the term flying saucer came from. A very famous sighting in 1947 by Kenneth Arnold put the term flying saucer directly into the minds of Americans, as the highly publicized incident ran with the term. Interestingly, the 1960s saw a prevalence of UFO sightings to switch from mostly flying saucer type to cylindrical shaped craft. The predominant type of craft would again change in the 80s to dark, polygonal shapes like the infamous black triangle. This is part of the reason why flying saucer designs are so symbolic of the 50s and of science fiction from that time, and also why it fits so well within the Fallout aesthetic. In Fallout 2 there is a very striking ship that the Hubologists are trying to get working again in order to blast their way into space. The ship is also referred to as the Shuttle and is nuclear powered and built by the government prior to the Great War. The Chosen One finds the shuttle in San Francisco and is tasked with finding fuel for it. The name that it is formally given is the ESS Quetzal and there don't appear to be any external fuel tanks shown so it is unknown if the shuttle was capable of blasting itself into space or if it needed additional boosters like the shuttle of our world. The direct reference is pretty obvious seeing as it looks like a stylized and more futuristic space shuttle. The only other craft that looks like that is the Russian Buran shuttle, which looks remarkably similar to the US space shuttle, and never had a chance to prove itself before the USSR fell and the program was abandoned. There are some interesting things about the ESS Quetzal, starting with its name. No spacecraft have ever been given such a designation in US history, and the prefix ESS is actually left over from earlier drafts of the Hubologists. ESS stands for Elronologist Spaceship, the name Elronologist being an early name for the Hubologists. This name was changed as it was seen as two on the nose referencing L. Ron Hubbard, the founder of Scientology. Quetzal is a bird found in South America that was associated with Quetzalcoatl which was a Mesoamerican deity that, among many things, was considered a boundary maker between heaven and earth, who frequently crossed this boundary himself, so that seems like a very apt metaphor considering its purpose. You can actually visit an extremely basic and unfinished interior of the shuttle, allegedly by pressing the 5 key while in the San Francisco map, but I have not verified this. There's nothing really to see. No way to get out and you can only observe walls that inform you that they are indeed shuttle walls. It is interesting to note that the Quetzal was nuclear powered. There have been multiple theoretical nuclear powered spacecraft models throughout the years. Nuclear pulse propulsion is a method where nuclear bombs are detonated behind a craft in order to accelerate it. This was researched in the 1970s with Project Orion, but was never fully explored. Fission and fusion thermal rocket designs revolve around a nuclear source heating a secondary liquid, gas, or solid that itself heats up and expands, delivering thrust. Nuclear cell designs 
use the decay of radioactive elements to have thrust delivered by particles imparting energy against the sail due to their own kinetic energy. There are more kinds of theoretical nuclear-powered spacecraft, but by looking at the Quetzal's design, it seems to have one large primary nozzle and two groups of four small ancillary ones. I think it is safe to say that it uses a method wherein either a secondary media is superheated by a fission or fusion process, as opposed to a sail or pulse design that would lack thrust nozzles. The recon craft in Fallout 3 was an alien craft that was meant to perform reconnaissance duties, but ended up crashing and killing the lone pilot. Coming to the craft will yield an alien blaster and alien power cells. With the Mothership Zeta add-on, it is also the location where the Lone Wanderer will get abducted. This craft is disc-shaped, although different from conventional flying discs or saucers. Most flying saucers are portrayed as being able to move in any direction, with no clear area providing thrust for the craft. The recon craft does have several thrust nozzles, and the positioning of the cockpit suggests that it flies more like a conventional aircraft rather than an omnidirectional saucer. This exact spaceship can be found in Fallout New Vegas as well, with the Wild Wasteland perk enabled and three aliens can be found nearby. This craft doesn't seem to resemble any one single craft, and instead pays homage to the popular disc and saucer designs popular in the 1950s and 60s. One of the motherships in Earth's orbit is named Zeta, or sometimes referred to as Mothership Zeta, like the DLC. It is a large conventional saucer-shaped alien craft that is armed with defensive shields, as well as some sort of laser or plasma cannon that is, of course, referred to as the Death Ray. This weapon can be used to attack targets on Earth, where it yields an explosion that seems as large or larger than a nuclear strike. This weapon can also be used to attack other spaceships. The craft houses a plethora of rooms and interesting technology, storage rooms where objects and people are stored, experimentation rooms where objects or people are experimented on, teleportation devices, healing arches, and other advanced tech. Of particular note are so-called abominations, which are experiments involving splicing human DNA or genes with that of aliens, if they have DNA at all, we don't really know and the human captives that have been abducted and cryogenically frozen for study. The Zeta Mothership is a very classic saucer design with a conventional layout, being thick in the middle with some sort of canopy at the center. The movie Earth vs. the Flying Saucers was made in 1956, and is a great example of the prototypical flying saucer concept of the 50s, which Fallout draws heavily from in most of its aesthetic. Some interesting facts about Zeta are that the chairs will bleed red blood if hit. The Lone Wanderer will keep his signature fingerless glove even when wearing the spacesuit, which would cause some serious issues with the pressure differential. And the Lone Wanderer can also unequip the spacesuit while outside the ship, which results in their head promptly exploding. The so called UFO makes an appearance in the Commonwealth in Fallout 4. After getting to a certain level, the craft will fly across the sky, trailing smoke and crashing. Upon investigating the crash site, a trail of blood from the injured Zetan pilot can be found leading to a cave. The craft is similar to the recon craft in Fallout 3, in that it is a saucer design, but was made to fly in a particular direction, rather than omnidirectionally like many saucer designs, including the Zeta mothership. It is quite distinct from the recon craft, with the pilot sitting atop the craft, and the presence of very retro-looking fins. This design so heavily implies unidirectional flight, much like the recon craft, that it may be more appropriate to call it a circular wing design. The only argument against this would be that there appears to be levitation technology underneath the craft that helps it hover or possibly stay aloft while in flight. There are many instances of circular wing craft in aircraft history. Several designs were designed around the World War II era, like the Vought XF-5U and the SAC AS-6, although these were only ever met with middling results. A craft that is much closer in layout and function was the VZ-9 Avrocar, developed in the 50s. It had the ability to hover, although the position of the pilot made it typically flown in a unidirectional fashion. This project ended up being cancelled when the design went from being a high-speed interceptor to a low and slow hovering craft and it just couldn't fulfill the military needs any better than conventional aircraft or helicopters. 
Even less well-known are designs by the U.S. military in the 1950s to develop lenticular-shaped missiles. These odd disc-shaped missiles, one of which was the Pi Wacket, which is a fun name, was meant to be a defensive missile, protecting high-flying B-70 bombers from surface-to-air missiles in the USSR. The design itself was very promising at the altitudes and speeds it was designed for. However, when the US military decided to rely on ICBMs to be the primary carrier for its nuclear arsenal, the project was scrapped. It seems both omnidirectional and unidirectional disc designs were extremely prevalent in 1950s sci-fi, as well as classified military projects, and therefore are the perfect basis for Fallout spacecraft. The Valiant One found in Fallout 76 is a large, mostly demolished structure in the middle of nowhere. It was not any sort of building, however. It is the remains of a pre-war space station. This spacecraft gradually lost altitude after the Great War ensured no efforts could be continued to keep it in orbit. An inhabitant of West Virginia pieced together part of its operational history when he found documentation that referred to a space project that would be able to fire beams to the Earth's surface. Not much else is known, like how Valiant One factored into these plans, but this presumed weapon system appears to have not been finished. Valiant One is in remarkably good condition for an orbital craft that crashed to the Earth's surface. Generally speaking, not much is left of satellites that re-enter the atmosphere in an uncontrolled fashion. This may imply that Valiant One was particularly well made, or may have come back to Earth in a semi-controlled fashion. The design appears to be a rotating wheel design, which is meant to simulate gravity through centripetal force, which, in theory, would mitigate the effects of microgravity on personnel in space. This could extend the amount of time that people could spend in space. This design was actually first envisioned in 1903, by Konstantin Tsiolkovsky, but received more attention in the 1950s, notice the trend here, when Werner von Braun updated the design drastically and NASA seriously looked into its viability. This design has significant design challenges, and that is the main reason why no such spacecraft has been constructed to date. Representations in popular culture run the gamut, from the 2001 A Space Odyssey novel to the Ender's Game novel, to Battlestar Galactica, and even as recent as the TV series The Expanse. The design lends credence to the idea that the US was heavily involved in long-term bouts in space, likely in conjunction with ambitious space projects. And that wraps up this video on the spacecraft of Fallout. While there are far fewer examples of spacecraft when compared to, for example, cars, in the Fallout universe, they are no less interesting in their presentation, design, and inspiration. I really hope you guys liked this video and hopefully learned some things. And if my videos ever inspire people to do a little research and learning on their own, I take that as a big win. I look forward to seeing you all in my next video.